why are you the way that you are? Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. There is construction going on outside. Apologies, but, you know, I can't do anything about that. Also, this is covered. Don't worry, I'm not going to hurt myself. There are many, many emotions that you can feel when you finally finish a book or a book series, especially a long one. But the worst emotion that you can feel when you're finally finished with something is relief. You know, relief that you're done and you no longer have to put up with the nonsense that you've been reading for the past however long. And when I finally finished volume four, which is book four, of Vigor Mortis, I felt relief. I, f I felt nothing but relief. I felt relief that I no longer had to put up with one of the worst protagonists ever. I felt relief that I no longer had to put up with obnoxious writing and storylines that just sort of prattle on and die. And to, to give you an idea of just how little I gave a shit about what was going on here and how obnoxious and annoying it was to get through, I listened to all four of them as audiobooks. And I mostly listened to them while I was at work, and I could only do three or four hours at a time, and then I just, I had to stop for the rest of the day. <laughs> like, the sound of silence was preferable to listening to this shit. Now, if I told you that this book series was about lesbian necromancers fighting an evil church while also finding out about an eldritch god that has their world in its grasp and them trying to fight against that, you might think that sounds awesome. And if I told you that it's about a girl from the slums slowly turning into a monster, you might think that's awesome too. I'm sorry, there's a fly. Do you remember Divided We Fall? You know, it was a book series where, if, if you haven't seen my video on it, go watch it. But it's a book series where the protagonist is supposed to be a sympathetic rebel against an overreaching federal government, but really he's just a murderer and he helps neo-Nazi militias commit ethnic cleansing. Like, again, go watch my video on that if you aren't familiar with it. But in that book series, Danny was supposed to be the good guy, but he's just so despicable that I wound up siding with the federal government, even though I didn't want to. And in Vigor Mortis, the heroes are so b heroes, please note, are so bad that I was on the side of the authoritarian church. Like, I, at first I was kind of on Vita, her, the main character's name is Vita. At first I was kind of on her side, but then as time went on, she just got worse and worse and worse. Because the church, while it's not wor while it's not great, it does keep people safe. Vita murders and enslaves everyone in her path and then pretends it's okay because she found out how the world really works. Now, I will say that Divided We Fall was deeply entrenched in real-world right-wing politics, so it's a lot more obnoxious to get through than Vigor Mortis, but I'd say they're equally stupid in that regard, because in both cases, it's showing exactly why the heroes, again, putting quotes around the word heroes, are awful people who need to be stopped. And while Vita is very sympathetic at the beginning, fundamentally she's just a bully. A mean, spiteful, arrogant bully, and she's rewarded for it. And I know a lot of you have already gotten really pissy and typed up comments below telling me I'm stupid and mean and bad and I should be ashamed of myself, because some fans have already tried to defend this series by saying the story is supposed to be about Vita becoming evil, and I'm missing the point by complaining about her awfulness. And if that's really what the story is supposed to be about, it fails. Like, I, I think that's what the story's supposed to be about. I don't think that this is like post-hoc justification or anything, but it does fail if it's a, trying to be a story about a villain protagonist. Because, uh, and I'll get into it a lot more later, but when you look at the way that the story ends and the way that everyone treats Vita, it feels like the books are making excuses for her, even though it's allegedly not trying to make excuses for her. But even if we set all that aside, that's just part of what I hated about this series, because beyond the awful protagonist, there are a hundred other reasons to hate Vigor Mortis. You know, the general lack of stakes in anything happening, the poor pacing, the fact that the books drag on substantially longer than they should. Like, you could cut out literally half of this and you wouldn't lose anything substantial. I hate the way that the characters are flippant and try to be funny and make jokes during moments that are supposed to be serious. Uh, 
I believe the kids these days call it MCU dialogue. I don't know, Chinos. You say Utopia, but what I'm hearing is kill everyone. And I really don't want to find a new dry cleaner. I hate the way that it changes genres every few chapters, going from fun adventure to dark and twisted horror to sanctimonious philosophy discussion, and then back and forth again and again without any real warning or transition. Uh, the beginning of book two was the worst for this. We'll, we'll get into that, but that one is by far the biggest and most jarring example of, whoa, okay, this just got really dark out of nowhere. I hate the way that the books introduce a dozen villains, one after another, who all seem like they'd be a great, seemingly impossible obstacle to overcome, and then Vita and or her friends just defeat them without breaking a sweat. You know, and look, I've seen positive comments for Vigor Mortis, like the fans really, really seem to love it, and I think it's the same as shit like Powerless or Fourth Wing, where the fans aren't looking for an actual story, they're just looking for the title of pages on TV tropes, you know, just throw in something like a super special main character that almost never struggles and has all the best powers and they will sing its praises. You know, it doesn't really matter what the quality is or anything. Although I should mention Vigor Mortis is better than those other two, like substantially better than those other two, uh, because it has some stuff that is genuinely great, but the bad stuff drags it straight into hell. And these books, as I said, are very long, and this is going to be a complicated critique, so I'm going to have to do a summary of the whole series and then follow it up with different sections covering issues I had. And really, it's a shame. I do feel almost kind of bad <laughs> hating Vigor Mortis, or at least hating it as much as I do, because there is plenty of stuff to like here. You know, the world that it takes place in is unlike anything I've seen before. Because at first it seems kind of like a standard, oh, it's a fantasy world where everyone lives on floating islands setting that we've all seen once or twice. But there's so much more to it than that. Especially later on when the sheer scale of this world, both like the, the size of it and how old it is, it, in both ways, it's gigantic. And once we see the scale of that, it's really, really impressive. Uh, the magic system is deep and complicated in some fascinating ways. You know, even by the end of the books, I was still learning more about magic and the way it worked. Most of the characters are very sympathetic, like both human characters and inhuman monsters. Even they have feelings and you kind of understand why they are the way that they are. It's just that that sympathy is ignored when it comes to the bad guys getting their comeuppance. Like we're, we're supposed to forget about how sympathetic they are for some reason. And at the beginning of the story, when Vita discovers her powers and she learns to use them in unique ways, I was really invested in her journey. Like, I wanted to watch her slowly grow stronger so she could save people, or even if she didn't save people, so she could do stuff that is cool. <laughs> you know, just something. I was really invested for a while. Okay, that fly. There are some lines and conversations in here that are genuinely funny and made me chuckle a little bit, which doesn't happen all that often. G granted, again, some of it is like really not good MCU dialogue tier, so not all of the humor lands, but some of it's pretty good. Uh, there, It's told in first person perspective, but it's split among a couple of different characters, and it's easy to tell who's who. You know, all the POV characters have unique voices. It's easy to tell Vita from Penelope, easy to tell Penelope from Lark, and so on. I think there's like six or seven uh, characters in total spread across four books, and they all, at first, sound different from one another, but later on they do kind of blend together. I think the last book needed to spend a little bit more time in editing. The action scenes are also great, at least at first. You know, after book two it feels like watching a bully attack weaker people, and that's just not fun to do. It, like, even if I was into the story and I was into Vita and I was rooting for her. By then she's just too powerful and it's kind of boring to watch her plow through most of her problems. But you know, at first the action scenes are great, but all of the good stuff in here is just far outstripped by the bad. You know, it's like having a lovely well done steak, but it's hidden under a pile of shit. You know, so it, it I, I, I didn't like these books, I don't recommend them. It's not the worst thing I've ever read, not even close, but Fuck me, it's so goddamn long. It's just exhausting to get through. Okay, uh, now I guess we're going to the summary, so spoilers ahead. Happy birthday! Here's your present! You're welcome. Alright, I'm really not exaggerating. There is a fuckload of stuff to cover here. I'm gonna leave out as much world building and smaller subplots as I can. 
and we'll cover them in later sections if they're really relevant, partially to avoid confusion and partially because, again, I will go over them later. <clears throat> so we start off with our main character, Vita. She's about 16 years old uh, at the beginning, and by the end, she's about 18 or 19. Uh, she is a street urchin, she's an orphan, on the streets of a city called Skyhope. <sighs> now, Skyhope is the capital city of a country called Volca. And, you know, the, uh, like I said earlier, they all live on giant islands that float in the sky. There are other countries on their island besides Volca, but they don't, don't really matter at any point. Now, Vita tries to steal food from a baker, and that baker savagely beats her for a few minutes. And then she awakens her, her magical talents that she didn't know she had, and she kills him. It turns out she can see people's souls and also tear them out of their body, which kills them, uh, just by touching them. Now, in this world, magic exists and pe pretty much anyone can learn it the old-fashioned way, but there are some people who also just have talents where they're, they're just born with it and they can do crazy stuff, and Vita has some sort of talent for necromancy. Now, she panics and grabs the baker's soul and stuffs it back into his body, and he comes back to life as an undead revenant, which th the difference between a revenant and a zombie is that a revenant still has his mind and memories from when he was alive, but he's also undyingly loyal to Vita and will do anything she says. Now, Vita tries to leave it alone and pretend that everything is fine at first, but she goes home and tells her sort of family about this. Like, yeah, she's been living in a shack with like some other orphans and two people who take care of them for like a year before the book series begins and she decides that they're her family at some point. It's, I don't know, it, it's, it's a little strange to be honest, but it's such a small issue I don't feel like getting into it. But anyways, she tells her sort of family about this and they tell her, hey, um, necromancy is illegal and if people see an undead revenant walking around, they're gonna kill him and then they're gonna wonder where he came from. Now, the church is called the Church of the Mist Watcher, and their enforcers are called Templars, and the Templars are very powerful, so Vita wouldn't really be able to run or fight or hide or anything if they came after her. Now for Exposition Corner. This is gonna be parts in here where I just have to step aside for a second and explain aspects of this world to you. So, basically, Animancy is magic that involves manipulating people's souls, or monster souls as well, because uh, anima is the Latin word for soul, if you didn't know. And necromancy is a subcategory of animancy. Now, most of what Vita does throughout the series is necromancy, but animancy is the umbrella term. So Vita goes back to the Revenant Baker, uh, and she rips the soul out of him, which kills him for good, and then she eats it, because it turns out she can actually eat other people's souls, and that will make her own stronger. Which, again, is very, very illegal in this world, and if she gets caught, she will be in trouble. Now, like I said, her sort of family is a bunch of orphans being taken care of by a married couple who are named Lynn and Rowan, and... I don't know, after the beginning, they are there, and they kind of do stuff, but they're not major characters, I wouldn't say, but they're, they're there throughout the whole series. Now, they all decide that Vita should, show, should go become a hunter. Hunters are people who go outside the walls of the city and slay monsters. Now, they train for a little while, strengthening her body, and she learns to fight with a spear. She's, like, she's not great at it, but she does have her powers, so she can use those if nothing else. Now, her powers allow her to sense souls in a radius around her, and as she grows more powerful, that radius grows more and more, so she can see or maybe C isn't the right word, but she can sense souls around her and, you know, warn people of incoming danger and stuff. She's like a good scout. And she can kill people just by touching them. A pilot error! Geez, I probably should have worn mittens. But only people with weak souls, which, you know, basically a regular person has a weak soul. And as you grow and train and become stronger, your soul becomes stronger. Uh, and as she becomes stronger, she can take down more people with a single touch. After a few weeks of this, Vita is finally ready, so she joins the Hunter's Guild. Now, like I said, she can't fight super great, but she does make a good scout. She pretends to just have a danger sense talent, and after a little while, she does tell people about the killing with a touch talent, and they're a little suspicious, because it's rare for somebody to have more than one talent, but it's not unheard of, so they just kind of drop it. 
Now she gets put on a team with other rookies led by a veteran named Remus. Now, one of the other rookies is named Penelope, and Penelope is a biomancer, biomancy being magic that deals with, you know, bodies. She serves as a healer for the most part, but she also has a talent for creating and spreading diseases. Now, they hate each other at first, but after a little while they become friends slash allies. The team goes out on a mission to kill some weak monsters, and Vita notices, while they're, you know, wiping them out, that they all have two souls, because turns out they are infected by parasites. And the parasites, uh, we later learn that they're called Nara. They're these little clear bits of slime, and if you touch them, they get absorbed into your body. Now, Remus and Penelope get infected, and Vita can see, because she can see they each have two souls all of a sudden. And Vita suggests using her power to kill the parasites, and they say, no, something might go wrong. We'll let a professional healer deal with it. And a few days pass, and then they take Vita outside the city alone, and they actually try to infect her with a Nara, but she kills it when it enters her body, because it turns out Nara actually take over your brain and gain all of your memories, and they can, you know, live your life and pretend to be you. Meanwhile, you are locked away inside, and you can see and hear and feel everything that's going on, but you're not in control of your own body. However, the Nara also have no brains or intelligence of their own. They, they only have the intelligence and personality of whatever animals they're possessing. And if they leave their current host, they become dumb creatures of instinct again soon. And the ones who have infected Remus and Penelope really don't want to do that. You know, it's some, it's some flowers for Algernon type shit, where they're like, oh, we used to be happy being stupid, but if we're stupid again after being smart, we'll be sad. And those two Nara plan on possessing and spreading to as many people as they can. Now, Vita, she kills her own slime and acts like nothing's wrong, and then she tries to kill Remus's slime, but it turns out their souls become just as powerful as their hosts. Really? Really? You don't need to keep fucking texting me, I swear to God. Nara's souls become just as powerful as the hosts that they're infecting, which means that Remus's slime is way too powerful for Vita to kill right now. Now, she is able to kill Penelope, but, or excuse me, she is able to save Penelope and kill the slime there, but she spares that Nara's life because while it was pretending to be Penelope, it helped her out a little bit. You know, clearly it wasn't trying to act normal and just trying to avoid bringing suspicion to itself. It was being friendly. Yeah, this isn't the only time in the series that something like that happens. Like people just trying to keep a low profile and because they didn't just murder everyone in their path, other people assume, oh, that means they're good guys. Now, when the Nara leaves her body, Penelope wants to kill it because, you know, it enslaved her for a while and it was a horrifying, traumatizing experience for her, but Vita won't let her do it. <laughs> Vita decides to let the Nara share her body, so it merges her memories and personality with the memories and personality it got from Penelope. And remember, it didn't really have a personality besides that beforehand because it was just an animal with no real mind. And because she's a combination of Penelope and Vita, they just call her Penta from that point forward. Now, Penelope also learns that Vita is a necromancer, but she's okay with it. Now, they go back to the Hunter's Guild and they warn people. By now, the Remus slime has infected and taken over an entire town. And some of the people infected are very, very strong. So they gather up some helpers, including a High Templar named Galdra the Annihilator, and they head off. Now, High Templars are the most powerful people in all of Volca. You know, they are city-destroying forces of nature. They're ludicrously powerful to begin with, and Galdra is the most powerful High Templar. Now, while they're heading out to this other town, they find the edge of the island, which Vita has never been to before. And she looks over, and thousands of miles below, she sees the god that they worship, who is called the Mist Watcher, and he's really just an enormous mass of eyeballs and tentacles. Like, basically over the course of the series we find out that when someone is born, or when creatures are born, the Mist Watcher will put a soul into their body, and then as they grow and live, their soul gets bigger and more powerful, and then after they die and the soul leaves their body, the Mist Watcher will reach up, grab it, and eat it. So, Really, this whole world is just him cultivating souls to eat. There is no afterlife, and you should keep that in mind because it's Vita's excuse for being awful. Now, while Vita is looking over the edge, the Mist Watcher notices her and looks at her, and this is called a perception event because the Mist Watcher even paying any sort of attention to something causes destruction in that general area. And when this happens, Vita's soul 
hatches. And, like That's how she describes it. She describes it like an egg that hatches, breaks open, and now it's an eyeball with tentacles coming off of it instead of just being an orb. Eyeballs and tentacles, kind of like the Mistwatcher. I believe that's what the kids call foreshadowing. Now she can use her soul tentacles to move stuff and grab souls that are out of reach and, you know, again, rip them out of people's bodies. They are made of anima, which means they're invisible to most people. Now, Galdra is suspicious and thinks that Vita brought on the perception event on purpose, and she nearly kills her, but Penelope, who is a noble woman, it didn't really matter before, before this point, but it, it matters now, uh, she's a noble woman, she just enslaves Vita. And now that Vita is the property of a noble, the Templars can't hurt her without just cause. And if you think the slave thing comes back, not really. It's, a, it's really just, yeah, it prevents the Templars from looking too closely into you for a while. And honestly, the, sure, whatever, this, this, this happens. Now, uh, they reach the village, and Penelope wants to just release a plague to kill all of the Nara. But Penta convinces them that there must be another way, so they sneak in, pretending to be infected, which... I mean, Vita sort of is, but whatever. Again, her and Penta are sharing the body. Like, if Penta ever tries to, you know, take over for real, Vita can just kill her. They putter around for a while, and then Penta gives a dramatic speech about how, hey, we don't need to enslave people, but then the other Nara just tell her to fuck off. And then there's a big battle, and Remus's Nara infects Vita and kills some people, then Penelope releases her plague, which kills them all, including Penta. Well, that sucks! And, but Vita manages to snag Penta's soul before the Mistwatcher eats it, like she can store souls within her own body, and then the Mistwatcher won't find them, and she vows to bring her friend back somehow, and that's the end of Volume 1. Which wasn't great, but it was at least a cohesive narrative. And that won't be the case going forward. Like, from best to worst, we have Volume 1, and then Volume 2, and then Volume 4, the last one, and then Volume 3. That one is the worst one by a decent margin. So Book 2, we start following a different hunter team out in the forest. Now let's rewind a little bit, because there's another island called Hive Rock that floats above the main island where most of the story takes place. So the, the island's called Verdant Top, by the way. And every time Hive Rock floats overhead, a bunch of humanoid bug monsters come down and attack, and they have to beat them off. Now, the last attack happened in Book 1. I just skipped over it because it wasn't that important at the time. Now, uh, when that attack happened, they dropped a bunch of mysterious rocks all over the forest, which, turns out, those were eggs. And the hunters come across a bunch of dead animals that had their limbs bitten off, but the rest of them were just left to rot. And they think, wow, that's weird. And a monster, which we... Later, they start calling them Rothiso, attacks and kills all of them except for two. The, these two get their arms and legs bitten off, and the Rothiso keeps it in their lair. One of them, whose her name is Claretta, is a biomancer, so she's able to heal herself and her friend while the Rothiso very slowly eats them alive. You know, like, it'll, they'll start growing off little nubs of their arms and legs, and then the Rothiso will bite them off, or it'll, like, start nibbling on their torso, and she can well, regrow it, you know? And as it eats them, it becomes more and more human, eventually taking on a human shape and learning to talk. And Claretta names it Lark. And they are kept here for months, and it's very unpleasant. Like, the sequence is very good, it's a good bit of horror writing, but it's such a massive shift in tone from book one that it threw me off, because it is dark and unpleasant. Now, eventually, some veteran hunters come by, and these guys are, like, way beyond Vita and her team. And they fight Lark, and they manage to rescue one of the prisoners, but Lark takes Claretta and runs off. And the hunters return to Skyhope and relay what happened, and they send another team to rescue Claretta and kill Lark. And that happens to be Vita's team. Why didn't they just send the original veteran team, who proved they can fight Lark already, and nearly killed her once already? You know, maybe just send them and then one or two other people for support? D don't worry about it, I guess. Just, just send rookies, along with a veteran uh, who have never fought this type of monster. You know, no nothing could go wrong. So. That's stupid! Use your common sense! Now, while all this was going on, Vita and Penelope have been experimenting with her necromancer powers because they've decided they want to make everybody immortal. Because Vita thinks that because there's no afterlife, no one would ever want to die. You know, just the, the sweet embrace of oblivion, apparently she thinks that wouldn't appeal to anyone. Whatever. Uh, so they bring a mage that died at the end of book one back to from the dead in order to teach Vita magic. 
And this woman is horrified to be an undead revenant, but she can't say no to any of Vita's orders. So Vita makes her teach her magic and help with some experiments. And Vita sees nothing wrong with enslaving somebody's mind like this. Just, just throwing that out there. Anyways, like I said, they are recruited to go off and fight Lark and rescue Claretta. And they find Lark, they have a difficult battle where they all nearly die several times, including Lark. Like, they almost kill her multiple times, but she's pretty smart, she's prepared, she knows the area, so she manages to survive. And they manage to rescue Claretta and run off. Lark pursues until Claretta tells her to fuck off. And Lark is shocked and horrified because she thought they were friends, and then she runs away. Now for another exposition corner. So Rothiso eat the souls of their victims. You know, when they bite off part of your body, e.g. your legs, uh, then they take part of your soul with it. But when you die, your soul leaves your body, so they re leave the rest of your flesh alone. And they also take on aspects of everything they eat. Kind of like the chimera ants from Hunter x Hunter. Like, every Rothiso looks and acts different. They're all just a mashup of various monsters that they've eaten. So Lark, like I said earlier, is humanoid. She has two legs, she has four arms, uh, she has sharp teeth, which can, you know, bite through anima, she can bite through souls, and she also has claws on her hands and she can make webs from them because she ate a bunch of spider monsters. She can also sense Vita's soul tentacles and her teeth can bite them off. So in some ways she's a hard counter to Vita's powers that sort of comes back later. So they take Claretta back to Sky Hope to safety and Vita's mother and father uh, work for a crime boss named Sky. Like this was kind of hinted at in the first book, but this is where we're first learning specifics about it. Basically, they just pay Sky protection money and he helps keep them safe in the slums. Now, Vita meets this guy and he looks like a woman, but he has the soul of a man and she thinks that's weird. And he insists on being referred to as a man because it turns out he's a transgen transgender man. Like, uh, eventually after this, Penelope does turn his body male. Like, she starts off in this book, but she doesn't finish until between books two and three. You know, she, she starts off making it so he can grow a beard and stuff. Now, they agree to work together for now, but just she tells Skye, like, hey, be, be nice to my family, and he agrees. Uh, but that doesn't work out for very long, because Vita's younger siblings, they're home alone one day, and some thugs come to try and shake them down for money, and as Vita arrives and tries to defuse the situation, one of her siblings is killed in a fight. And Vita immediately tears the souls out of all the thugs and then brings back some of them to go take the bodies of the others and dispose of them and then kill themselves. But one of the people that she killed and brought back is actually younger than she is. Turns out he is the son of the baker that she murdered way back at the beginning of book one. He is on the streets because he doesn't have his dad to support him anymore. Who would have thought that your actions have consequences, Vita? Now, uh, Vita tortures him for a bit because he was involved in the death of her sister and then makes him think that she's going to go and murder his mom before finishing him off. Because that's what heroes do. Meanwhile, Lark has moved into a different town and she pretends to be a regular human girl there. You know, like she hides her whole body, wears a mask, and then just makes friends and exists there for a while. Uh, but she also murders and eats a couple of people but she feels, like, really bad about it. People realize that there is a Rothiso there, so Vita and her team get sent to the town to find Lark and eliminate her as a threat. Now, they get sent with the original veteran hunters who fought Lark way back at the beginning and rescued one of the prisoners. Like, now they're sending the experts. I don't, I don't know why they waited until now, but whatever. And along the way, they are attacked by a massive flying Rothiso, and the veteran hunters are killed. But Vita just grabs their souls, brings them back as undead, and they manage to, all working together, kill the monster. Vita eats the Rothiso soul, and she instantly becomes way more powerful than she did before. Now, her teammates, besides Penelope, didn't know she was a necromancer, and they're frightened when they see that she's a necromancer, but since they're stranded out in the forest alone, surrounded by really powerful monsters, they agree to keep the revenants around until the mission is over. Now, they reach the town where Lark is hiding out. Vita finds her and attacks by herself, leaving all her teammates behind. Because, you know, whatever happened to teamwork makes the dream work. I don't know, but Vita doesn't care. 
She can jump over buildings and run super fast now. She's just way stronger than she was before. But her body is too weak to handle it, but she shatters bones when she does it. But she also feels no pain, and they have magical healing, which can stitch her back up in just a couple of minutes, so I guess it's fine. And this is also only a problem in this book. In the later books, her strength is not something that hurts her when she uses it. Anyways, Vita fights Lark for a little bit. Lark runs home, kills her adoptive father, and then Vita finds her. She takes a few teeth and one of her ears as, quote, proof of death, and then she just leaves her. She, she lies to her team, who are allegedly her friends. Like, she, she thinks Lark is good and not a monster. Why does she think that? Just, just, just vibes, basically. <laughs> like, okay, sure, Lark has changed a little bit, but she's still a monster, and Vita doesn't know all of the stuff that the audience knows. Anyways, on the way back, while Vita is sleeping, one of the revenants that she created begs to be released, and her friends kill him, you know, preventing him from being an undead slave for all eternity. And when Vita finds out about this, she's really upset, and Penelope is too, because her friends are totally the assholes, because they freed somebody from being an undead slave, and having his mind controlled by a necromancer forever. <laughs> Now, did I mention that Vita can now read thoughts and emotions from people's souls? Because she can read thoughts and emotions from people's souls. It's impossible to lie to her now. She can tell one of her teammates is planning on turning her in when they reach Skyhope, and this won't result in her death. Like, the church doesn't automatically execute all animancers. Like, they have jobs for them. Basically, just you can work for the church as an animancer, helping them track down and defeat evil animancers. But Vita doesn't want to do that, so... She murders her friend and holds on to her soul. And spoiler alert, she later enslaves her too. What the fuck? Her other teammates agree to keep her secret. Uh, one of them, out of fear, who he quits the hunters like immediately and then goes on to join the Templars. Uh, the other one keeps her secret because he's perfectly fine with her enslaving and mind controlling people. You know, one, one of the veteran hunters that died and then Vita brought her back as a revenant. That was actually his mom, and he's fine with his mom being an undead slave forever. He, he's not even disturbed looking at her and talking to her, even though it's described as like half her head is gone and you can see her brain inside her skull. Like he, He's perfectly fine with Vita doing this to his mother. Anyways, there's no easy way to bring this up, but Sky, the crime boss from earlier, is also a terrorist. He's planning a big attack. Now, time for Exposition Corner. The Mist Watcher is attracted to metal when a lot is gathered in one place, and that causes perception events because when he notices there's a lot of metal, he'll just reach up with a unfathomably, unfathomably large tentacle, grab the metal, and pull it down and eat it, and that'll just cause a bunch of destruction. And we later learn he eats metal because it just makes him more powerful. Most of the tools in this world are made from stuff like wood or chitin, which chitin, if you didn't know, is the stuff that crustacean shells are made of, so like crab shells and shrimp legs and stuff like that, that's chitin. And a lot of monsters in this world also have chitin shells. So that's where they get it. The terrorist attack is going to be done by causing a perception event. Like basically Sky has a teleporting friend, he'll have his teleporting friend teleport a bunch of metal under the royal palace, and then the Mist Watcher will reach up, grab it, and that'll like kill the king and the nobles, because Sky wants to make society more equal and help the downtrodden. And Vita agrees with his overall goal, but she also thinks that killing a bunch of people is a bad way to go about it. And honestly, I think that's like the most reasonable Vita acts throughout the entire series. <laughs> now, Vita fights Sky for a little while in an attempt to stop him, and even though she's way more powerful than he is, he manages to run away and enact his plan. So the Mist Watcher swings a tentacle up and destroys half of Sky Hope. Now, Vita runs around in all the wreckage trying to save people, and there's also some High Templars around doing the same thing. Like, she's able to use her soul-sensing ability to, you know, know where people are, like, hiding under the rubble and stuff, and grab them. But she also grabs a lot of the souls of the dead ones and hides them in her body so that she can, you know, bring them back as undead slaves later. Now, the High Templars that are also going around notice, after a bit, that she's using animancy. And at first, they try to arrest her peacefully, but she resists. And they manage to catch her without too much trouble. Because, remember, High Templars are insanely powerful. A at least they're supposed to be, at this point in the story. And then several months later, we don't know exactly what's happened to Vita, this last part is from Penelope's POV, uh, Volca is at war with another country who is trying to 
press the advantage and attack them while they're recovering from the perception event. Because their old king died in the attack, their new king is just a puppet of the church. And apparently, the church helped Sky get the medal he needed to cause the attack. And apparently, the church actually helped Sky get a hold of the medal that he needed to cause the attack, so they were involved in this. And, I mean, that's bad, but they, they also kind of forget about it <laughs> later on. Anyways, um, Penelope, who, remember, is a noblewoman, is sent at the head of an army to fight the enemy. But they don't give her nearly enough support. Like, they're expecting her to just be killed and her army to be slaughtered. But she's not just going to stand by and let that happen. She fake surrenders to the enemy general and then goes into his camp and releases a plague there. And a couple hours later, it kills them all. And it's actually a really cool sequence. It's a cool way to end this book. I think it's technically a war crime, but, you know, it's cool. And Penelope is now in love with Vita, and she vows to rescue her. Meanwhile, Lark has moved to a new town. She lives outside the town in the forest and protects people from monsters, but after a little while of protecting people, they grow to like her, and they let her live with them, and she begs forgiveness for all her past sins in a church. And after a little while, Galdra the Annihilator shows up and takes her away to be trained as one of the Templars. And that is the end of book two. Then finally we go to book three, which is by far the worst and most unfocused one. It begins with the introduction of a new character named Jaleesa. Now Jaleesa is a Templar. She has a talent which gives her super senses. So sight, hearing, smell, all of that. She can actually see like bacteria walking around on people's faces and stuff. That, that's how good her senses are. Now, she's assigned to a secret prison where Vita, as well as a bunch of other powerful uh, magical prisoners, are kept. Now, she sympathizes a lot with Vita because... I don't know, she <laughs> doesn't really deserve it, but Jaleesa sympathizes with her a lot. And it, it's been about two years since the end of the last book, and her Vita's body is growing and changing to be more like the Mist Watchers. You know, she has eyeballs growing on, like, her thigh and tentacles coming out of her arms and stuff now. Meanwhile, Lark is doing Templar training. She pretends to be a human for a while and then reveals she's a Rothiso, and eventually people are just okay with a Rothiso walking around. And she also becomes friends with some of the other Templars, and that's kind of it as far as Lark's storyline goes for now. Meanwhile, Penelope is still doing immortality research, and she's planning on breaking Vita out of prison, along with Skye's help, because her and Skye are allies now. That, yeah, they never really explained that. <laughs> she also enslaved somebody and turned him into a living sex doll that looks like Vita. You know, she mind-controlled him, erasing memories and adding new stuff until his old personality was gone, and now he just wants to serve and he wants to have sex with Penelope. He still remembers his old self, but he likes how he is now better. <laughs> and this is all barely a footnote in the story. Anyways, they eventually attack the prison and they free Vita, Sort of. Really, Vita just senses her friends coming and then breaks out on her own and meets them halfway. Like, she didn't really need them to escape, it seems. She's just gotten more powerful <laughs> during her stay. And after she breaks out of her restraints, she learns she can eat her metal restraints. <laughs> because, another exposition corner. Metal is valuable because, because it can hold mana. Like, if you enchant something made of rock or other materials, it'll wear off after a while, whereas if you enchant metal, it'll, the enchantment will stay there forever. And Vita learned in the last book that she can't use the Mist Watcher's mana to perform magic, which most mages, when they perform magic, they're taking in mana from the Mist Watcher and then sending it out to do stuff. But Vita can't. She has her own dimension, which she reaches into and grabs her own personal mana out of. And when she eats metal, it actually widens the channel that she pulls mana through, which makes her spells more powerful. And by now, pretty much everyone relate, realizes that Vita is somehow related to the Mist Watcher. Now, she releases the only other prisoner who is down on her level, like the maximum, maximum security part of the prison. And he's an Animancer as well. His name is Ars. He is a Lich, meaning his soul can leave his body after death and enter a new one. That's why he and Vita weren't killed by the Templars. They thought that if they killed them, their souls would just fly off and then they would, you know, go back to doing what they were doing before. They would no longer be contained. And when Vita talks to Ars, he claims to be, be Vita's father slash creator, and she is... Weirdly, she's completely uninterested in hearing anything about that. Then he kills himself and flies off, and that's the last we see of him in this book. I'm sure letting a powerful Animancer feared by all of Verdantop free 
I'm, I'm sure that won't cause any issues. During the escape, Vita kills and then re-enslaves every single Templar except for Jalisa and a few others. Why does Vita kill them? Well, because they beat and tortured her for two years. Specifically, they wanted her to release the souls of all the people she's killed that she's storing in her body. Because, again, she's preparing to turn them into undead slaves. And if she leaves their souls out, the Mistwatcher will eat them, which most people think leads to the afterlife, but Vita knows is, no, there's no afterlife, they're just eaten, and then they stop existing. And we never see the torture that she went through, so it falls kind of flat. And also, Vita, remember, she feels no pain, and she gets magically healed, so there's no permanent damage. Honestly, it doesn't sound that bad, but I suppose Vita is a good guy, so it's okay for her to massacre anyone who's even remotely related to her mistreatment. Vita is reunited with her family, she makes a bunch of revenants, and then she takes the freed prisoners and the staff into the forest, and then they just build a camp, which slowly over the course of the rest of the series turns into an entire town. Now, Jalisa and the other Templars, after a little while of this, run off and try to go back to Skyhope, and they make it right outside the walls of the city, and then Vita and her revenant army catches them. Now, earlier she promised Jalisa not to kill her, so instead she makes her watch as her friends die. Like, she just rips their souls out. And I should mention that one of the people she kills is pregnant, and Vita knows this. The army shows up, and some of its most powerful members fight Vita for a bit. One of them is Remus, her old hunter mentor. Because he was, after the Nara incident, he was arrested for gross negligence, and now he's a slave for the army, but he doesn't seem to mind, because according to him, it's basically the same job, so... Okay, sure, good for him. And Vita decides she owes him, so she doesn't kill him, she just humiliates him and steals his one-of-a-kind magic sword, and then breaks it and eats it. I guess she doesn't feel too attached to him, even though without his help she would have died several times. Great. So she has very little trouble fighting him and the others either. She's just more powerful than anyone else with very, very little effort. Uh, but Galdra appears and she is forced to run away, but Galdra can't just kill her because again she's a lich, so she manages to escape. And Jalisa gets to go back into the city and go back to the Templars. After a little while, they assign her to lead the squad that Lark is in, and the squad also has a couple of other people that Vita knew, like Bentley, who was her hunter teammate who ran off and joined the Templars. Uh, and it turns out Lark is actually being groomed to become an anti-lich weapon, because remember, when she eats people, she eats part of their souls as well. Eventually, they send a small army uh, of Templars to Vita's village to kill her, including, you know, Lark and her squad, and a High Templar. Now remember, these guys are a city-destroying force of nature, so at first they cut a massive swath of destruction through the entire forest. Well, Vita's able to deal with the High Templar very easily because off-screen, she killed a dragon and brought it back as a revenant, and it's invisible, so it's able to sneak up behind the High Templar and kill them instantly. How satisfying. Now, Vita winds up fighting Lark and her squad, while the other Templars fight her undead army, because she has enslaved hundreds of people now, and Lark manages to kill Vita, but she reinfects her own body, like she brought herself back as a revenant. <laughs> As a revenant, Vita taunts Jalisa, saying that she's going to murder all her friends but leave her alive so she can watch. And then finally, Galdra appears. She was actually supposed to be here the whole time, but she just wound up being late. And she appears, she fights revenant Vita for a bit, and she does kill her. Yay! However, because Vita's a lich, she's able to send her soul into the body of one of Lark's teammates, who is a boy named Melik, and she takes him over. Basically, she hollows out his soul and then hides inside it so that other people looking at it, it'll just, it'll look like Melek's soul. But she, she kills him and then she absorbs all his memories and subsumes him. So, yeah, that's a thing she did. And you might think that would be the end of the book, but we still have like 20% left. If you're reading it normally, that comes out to about 200 pages. And if you're listening to it as an audiobook, which, remember, that's what I did, it's about five hours of content still after this. Now, the reason Galdra wasn't at the battle at first is because Penelope and Skye took the opportunity to massacre a bunch of Templars. However, while this is going on, Skye betrays Penelope and she's captured by Galdra. Galdra uses animancy, which she's not authorized to do, to brainwash her and, you know, she 
is her slave for a little while, but then she eventually escapes and undoes the brainwashing. But while doing it, she also brainwashes herself to be a better person. And she also uses biomancy to completely remake her body, so now she's an eight-foot-tall dragon lady. <laughs> Which, that's somebody's fetish. <laughs> Meanwhile, Vita is pretending to be Melek the Templar, and she manages it for a little while, because remember, he, she took all his memories, but Jaleesa figures it out, and despite watching her massacre hundreds of people and knowing that she killed Melek, who is one of her squad mates, she's fine with the situation and keeps Vita's secret for a little while, because... I don't fucking, just, I, I don't know, man. Don't, don't apply logic to most of this shit. Uh, and so the squad goes off to hunt some Rothiso in the forest, and the others find out that Vita killed Melek and took his place. And they're all fine with this. After killing a bunch of Rothiso, Hive Rock comes back, and they fight off another invasion. During the battle, Galdra the Annihilator is there. She, you know, she's flying around, ganking dudes. And then out of nowhere, Penelope in her new dragon body appears and kills her without any trouble. And then Vita brings her back as a revenant, and they fly up to take the fight to Hive Rock. Penelope manages to unleash a plague, which kills a bunch of the bug people. Uh, we later learn that they're called Athanatos, because, fun fact, Athanatos is a Greek word meaning immortal. Like, Thanatos is the old Greek god of death, and Athanatos just means without Thanatos. So it's literally just a group of people who call themselves the immortals. I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. During the battle, Vita is killed again, but she takes over the body of an Athanatos queen. And finally, that's the end of book three. So we go to book four, and the first chunk of this book is Vita pretending to be Malrosa, who is... Malrosa is actually a princess of the Athanatos, which basically just means she's a young queen. But whatever, Vita killed her and took her over, and she's pretending to be her. But she gets found out both by Malrosa's younger sister and the leader of the Athanatos, who is just called the Progenitor, very quickly. And they're weirdly okay with it. They just let her, <laughs> they just let her do her thing. Exposition Corner. Uh, their society is kind of like an ant colony. You know, they have a few queens which are immortal, and they, like, give birth and put their own souls in the new body when they're close to death. And they also birth the rest of the, co the colony, but while they're young, they manipulate their souls so that they love serving in whatever role they're assigned, whether that's soldier or worker or playwright or whatever. Uh, but also, no one goes hungry. They're basically communists, so there's, they're, like, there's benefits to this society. And Vita thinks it's a perfect society because, you know, mind-controlled slaves, is that, that's her idea of a perfect society. It turns out Hive Rock keeps trying to conquer Vita's home and commit genocide of all the humans living there because they just need resources. You know, like, they, they need food, they need water. They have other colonies that they've taken over as well, but they're looking to take over Verdantop because that has a lot of resources that they need. Vita decides that there must be a peaceful solution to this conflict and decides to help the Athanatos take over Verdantop because, you know, just condemn your friends to tributary dominance. You know, just let, let them still take over, just not kill everybody. That's basically Vita's plan at this point. <laughs> There's a very long sequence where Vita learns to play a game called Hoop Ball, and the entire, entire time I was listening to that, I was fighting off the urge to jump in fucking traffic. Now, during all of this, Vita learns that the Nara, the clear slime monsters from book one, are actually called the children of Nara. And you might be thinking, well, then who is Nara? Will this be a mystery we have to wait and see to find the answer to? No, we, we meet Nara immediately. Like, Vita goes into her other universe and talks to her there, because fuck mysteries, I guess. Nara is the sister of the Mist Watcher. They were both beings from that other universe, and at some point in the distant past, they consumed everything in that universe. There's nothing left there, and so they came over here. Now, Nara created both the Nara and the Rothiso as remote mouths. You know, the souls that they eat, she absorbs, or at least absorbs part of it. Because it turns out that the stuff souls are made of, anima, is just matter in their other universe. And mana is just their universe's version of energy. So the Nara and the Rothiso are kind of bioweapons, which characters were thinking before this point they were bioweapons, but not really. Eventually, Vita goes to another island that the Athanatos have already conquered, and tries to prove that there's a better way. You don't have to just kill everyone there. And there used to be a race of squid people living there, and Vita is able to find a few hiding survivors using her soul sensing, because she can sense for miles away now. 
and she tries to convince the other Athanatos that these people, like they're a race of squid people, can be useful, but they refuse, and so Vita just kills all of them. And as far as we know, that was the last of them. Like, she wiped them all out. She just commits a literal genocide. She does bring this up very briefly later, and she seems to feel kind of bad about it, but she doesn't feel that bad about it. Later, she goes home and she tries to convince people to send resources to Hive Rock, because she's basically just coming there to say, hey, we are now tributary vassals of these guys, just send them stuff and they won't kill us all. And nobody wants to do it, but they also don't realize that she's there to conquer them. I, I, I don't know, v Vita's whole thing at this point is to try and conquer Verdantop, but she never really tries to conquer Verdantop. It's extremely stupid. Now, also, while Vita was away, Penelope was able to expose that Galdra used animancy, so the church forgives her for killing their best fighter. And notice how stuff, there's no structure to anything anymore, stuff is just sort of happening. Do you notice how confusing it all is? So some people who are being controlled by Rs attack their village in the forest, and Vita decides to go and kill him. Exposition corner. Now earlier I mentioned that Rs said he was Vita's father slash creator, and well, he was. He took a bit of the Mistwatcher's anima and put it into a developing fetus, and that fetus was born as Vita. Sort of. Because originally she was actually a boy, she, she was Ars' biological son, but then she died, and then her soul went into the body of an orphan girl and took over. And the same way that she took over, you know, Melik and Malrosa, she just did that, but she was such a little kid that she doesn't remember doing it. So Vita used to be a boy, and now she's a girl, and... Remember how she described her soul as being an egg that hatched? Just, just throwing that out there. But Vita is weirdly disinterested in learning anything about her own backstory, and I'm not sure why, because I was enthralled. I was really interested in finding out where she came from, but whatever, she doesn't care. Anyways, they go to another country where ours has actually enslaved the local population by manipulating their souls. And they're thinking, wow, it's so evil that ours would do this, but it's okay when Vita does it, because... Ours keeps them alive while he does? I don't know. Then there are some people, they're not stupid, they're full of shit. <laughs> Whatever, they attack, and Sky is actually there now, and Penelope kills him, and then Vita fights Ars and kills him for good. And there is still a quarter of the freaking book left. Will there be a plot? Eventually, after a little while, I'm skipping over some stuff, but eventually there's a plot. So after a bunch of other shit no one cares about happens, Nara actually warns Vita that there's going to be something called a Skybreak event. She asks the progenitor about it, and the progenitor tells her it'll be like a massive earthquake that hits every island at once. So Vita evacuates all the people out of Skyhope to safe places. And if you're wondering what's a Skybreak event exactly? Well, it turns out that the Mist Watcher is flying through space and all of the islands just orbit him. You know, he's like a big planet and they're his moons and there's also mist over their heads, so they can't actually see up into space. And when the Mist Watcher reaches a new solar system, he leaves this little bubble and goes to, you know, break apart other planets and stars and then eat them. So they see the Mist Watcher rise out from where he is, break through the mist, and then the mists open and they see the stars and everything, and they're like, holy shit. And then he grabs another planet, which we know has intelligent life because Jaleesa can see that there are buildings and creatures on it, and he sends a couple pieces down to become new floating islands, because there are, I, I really need to emphasize, there's thousands of these things, each with different intelligent species on them, uh, it's just that we barely see any of them, and then after breaking it apart, he eats the core, and then he goes to eat the star of this solar system, which is way, way bigger than him, and takes him many days to finish consuming. And if you haven't figured it out by now, yes, humans in this universe did originally come from Earth. Like, the Mist Watcher ate it a long time ago. Feel free to roll your eyes, I did. Although, to be fair, it is hinted at before this point. Like, Penelope's last name is Vesuvius, and they do confirm that she's named after Mount Vesuvius, and they actually tell the story of Mount Vesuvius erupting and destroying Pompeii. So, you know, it's not like it came completely out of nowhere. Now, I will be honest, this last sequence, the sheer scale of it is incredible. Like, the awe that the characters feel at realizing the true nature of their world and seeing just the size of everything, the awe that they feel is pretty infectious. I'll, I'll, I'll give the book that. It, it was a pretty cool scene. Now, Vita takes friends to Nara, who is on another island, 
and Nara has a plan to save the universe. The Mist Watcher is going to, you know, eat it all eventually, and there won't be anything left except for him. So her plan is to combine her and Vita's powers so that they can eat all the souls in this world, except for some of Vita's loved ones, and then it, it, that'll, you know, steal the Mist Watcher's powers and make it difficult for him to, you know, rebuild his farm, which he's using to make more and more anima, and then flee and tour the universe, eating more and more to become more powerful, and eventually, one day, they will be able to stop their brother. Vita seems to go along with it at first, but she refuses and hatches her own plan. It takes a little while, but she does it. Uh, she draws the Mist Watcher's attention to Nara, which forces Nara to flee, otherwise her brother will you know, kill her, and we never see her again. And then Vita strips off her physical body, becomes a pure soul, and she flees across space for thousands of years, eating metal everywhere she goes to become more powerful, until she reaches a world that has intelligent life. And she becomes their guardian god, she tries to groom them until they will one day become powerful enough to kill the Mist Watcher. She gives them souls and then lets them grow and eats them after they die, just like the Mist Watcher did. And after a few hundred years of this, Penelope shows up. She turned herself into a god, like Vita. How? Don't ask questions. They're together now and everything is good. And then the book ends. Yeah, that, that's it. That, that's the last of it. Famous last word. Stingray's love foreplay. So, I hate the term Mary Sue. Also, this thing's getting kind of heavy. I'm just setting it down. I don't care. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I hate the term Mary Sue, which is why I very, very rarely use it. It's not that it's a bad term or one that doesn't have utility. It's just that people overuse it to hell and back. You know, most of the time when people online especially complain about Mary Sue's, they just mean character I don't like. Or a lot more often, they just mean woman character who does things. As a result of them overusing it, people hear the term Mary Sue and they don't understand the gravity of it, so I don't bother using it very often. So please take me seriously when I say that Vita is the ultimate Mary Sue. Like, the entire world revolves around her, and the entire world bends to her will. Everyone loves her except for the bad guys, who are usually bad for no reason. They're just, they're just bad because they're bad. And when she does bad things, everyone forgives her, even when they acknowledge that what she did was bad. Like, before she kills Ars, he basically comes out and says this as much. Like, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but he basically just says, Oh, you're good because you're good, and I'm bad because I'm bad. Therefore, everything you do is good, and everything I do is bad, no matter who it hurts. Like, again, I'm paraphrasing, but he is calling out her hypocrisy. Because they're both awful people, but Ars kind of seems to acknowledge that he is an awful person. But Vita seems to unironically believe that, yes, I am good no matter what, therefore everything I do is good. It, it's really dumb. No matter what Vita does, she's the good guy, and anyone who disagrees with her is evil. What, she's never allowed to look bad, and fundamentally that's what a Mary Sue is. It's not character who's good at things, it's character never fails at anything, and everyone fawns over them all the time. And that becomes much more obvious when you see how ludicrously overpowered she is by the end. Because here is a list of powers that Vita has by the end of the story. She can sense anyone's soul for several miles in every direction, making it impossible to sneak up on her. She can tell their thoughts and feelings based on their souls so no one can trick her or lie to her. She can tear most souls out, killing people instantly. She can use souls to create undead servants just as strong as they were when they were alive. She can put souls into objects, allowing her to use powers they had in life. E.g., when she murders her friend for threatening to go and turn her in, that friend has the power to make inanimate objects really hard, so she puts her soul into a sword, and then that sword can become unbreakable. She can put pieces of her soul into objects to control them, e.g., put a piece into a door that's locked and then cause the door to unlock. She can eat souls, becoming more powerful. She can eat metal. She has super strength, speed, and durability. She has super healing. She can teleport thousands or millions of miles at once. She can travel through space without issue. She can survive her body's death and possess new bodies with her soul. She can mimic her new body's soul so no one realizes it's her. She can throw out small sentient shards of her soul that eat other people's souls and weaken her opponents. She can blow up other people's spells before they even take effect. 
She can cast magic from a dozen other schools, including things like telekinesis, amplifying her voice, and healing. She can use her own almost infinite pool of mana when casting, so she doesn't have to worry about getting tired the way other people do. She can inject her mana into the area around her, preventing other magic from being used in that area. She can use her multiple hands and tentacles to weave spells way better than anyone else. That's a long list. And she doesn't have to work for most of that list. She kills a few big monsters to eat their souls, but the only one that she kills and eats their soul where it feels like a real triumph is the flying Rothiso in book two. You know, the one that attacked her squad and made her reveal that she's a necromancer. Like, that was a difficult battle, and she had to sacrifice something to win. In this case, sacrificing her secret to win. But other than that, it just feels like she wanders around eating weak monsters and gets extremely powerful as a result. Like, like she just went around killing rats and then hit the level cap off screen somewhere. That's really what it feels like. There's a point in book two where she learns to rip out small pieces of other people's souls at a time. So it makes them weaker and weaker until she can you know, grab the whole soul and rip it out. And I really liked that part. It made Vita seem smart and seem like she was using her powers in unique, creative ways. Same with Penelope wiping out an entire army with disease. But then they both become so powerful that they just barrel through most of their problems. The last time I saw a protagonist this overpowered was in Reaper's Creek. And this shit was written by fucking Onision. No one should be comparing themselves to that. Now, it's not as bad as Reaper's Creek, admittedly. It comes close, but it's not as bad because the Mist Watcher and a few other antagonists are still beyond Vita at the end. And at the very least, there is a sense of progression. It's not an earned sense of progression, but at the beginning, even after Vita finds out about her powers, the High Templars and some others feel like insurmountable foes, and it's just eventually they become a joke. You know, it's not, she's not OP from the instant she learns about her powers like in Reaper's Creek. And when Vita breaks out of prison, she sort of does it with help from her friends, but she also escapes before they reach her because she's just gotten more powerful over the time that she's been held in captivity. You know, she's been sitting in a cell restrained for two fucking years, and while doing that, she widened her mana channel so that she can do even more magic than she could before. I thought she needed to do to eat metal to widen her mana channel, but whatever, sure, whatever. It, it honestly feels like a skit from an infomercial, you know, where it's saying, get jacked while sitting on your ass and doing nothing. Like that, it feels like she did that. Now, protagonists becoming stupidly overpowered can happen one of two ways, or rather it can work if you do it in one of two ways. Either they don't become overpowered until near the very end, or you just play it off as a joke. If Vita had become this powerful near the end of the final book, it wouldn't be that big a deal, especially if she actually had to, you know, work for it. If the scene with the army of Templars attacking her in the forest was a difficult battle for her, and she barely managed to defeat anyone before Galdra killed her, that scene would have worked a lot better, because even if I disliked Vita, I would be able to get into her struggle. But she wipes the floor with them, and she only dies because Lark got the jump on her and used an ability that Vita forgot about. Like, literally. Lark has spines on her back that she pops out, and it cuts Vita's head in half. But Vita just forgot that she had them there. And then she becomes even more powerful after that. And so does Penelope when she turns herself into a dragon lady. You know, they blow through everything in their path, except for the Mist Watcher, which might have been fine if the Mist Watcher was more of a present villain, but he's only the immediate villain for the last 10% of the last book. Beyond that, he's just a looming threat that doesn't know they exist, you know? And an overpowered character, an overpowered main character, I should say, can work if they're at least likable, and at first Vita's likable. You know, she had a hard life, but she's trying to make something of herself and help others while also doing that. You know, that, that's, it, it works for a little while, but I began to dislike her around halfway through book one, because when Penta and the Nara took over Penelope's body and psychologically tortured her for weeks, Vita views Penelope as a friend by this point, but because Penta healed her family a little bit while, they, while Penta was, again, trying to keep a low profile while she was pretending to be Penelope, Vita sees her as a friend too, and then just from then on decides she doesn't need to kill the Nara. And I mentioned this earlier, but 
Penta is trying to keep a low profile. You know, she's trying to make people think that Penelope is still herself. There's no indication she did this because she's a good person. She just did it because that's what's expected of her. And because Vita refuses to wipe out the Nara, several people die, and the ones that don't die spend a lot more time as mind slaves, which is, again, very traumatic and unpleasant. Vita seems to think that maybe they can come to some sort of agreement, but that would mean creating some sort of mindless bodies for them to inhabit. Technology, which they don't have. Like, they, they don't have the ability to make mindless bodies for the Nara to inhabit. But maybe it'll be possible one day, but the Nara would still be enslaving these people for years before they were able to free them. It's easy for Vita to share her body, because, you know, if Penta tries to take over for real, she can just kill her with a thought. Most people don't have that option. So I'm not sure Vita really understands that other people are scared of this for good reason. You know, this feels kind of like somebody tried to make the Yerks from Animorphs into the good guys, and that's not how you should do it. Like, you can feel sympathy for them while also acknowledging that they are inhuman monsters that can only exist in their current state by enslaving people. And at first, when I read that, I, I didn't like it, but I just thought Vita was stupid. But then as time went on, it became clear that everything her friends do, do that's, that's all fine, but she'll hate others for acting the exact same way that she or her friends acts. You know, later, she brings Penta back to life in a new slime body, and Penelope is kind of pissed about it, understandable, because again, Penta did torture her for a long time. But then, she's so pissed at Penta in her new body that she tortures her for a little while, and Vita just doesn't do anything about it? You know? It, like, honestly, for half the series, Vita is carrying around Penta's soul and planning on bringing her back to life, but then she just kind of disappears from the story in the last book. I... I don't know why, you know? But that's not the important part. The important part is that Vita is going, okay, one of my friends hurt my other friend, and I'm okay with that. But then the other friend hurts the first one in retaliation for that, and I'm okay with that too, I guess. I don't... It doesn't make any sense. Like, there's no consistency to any of this. It's like protagonist-centered morality and character laundering for dummies. If, if you are Vita or one of Vita's friends, you can do no wrong. That thread only gets worse throughout the series, too, because... Vita, again, murders several of her friends, she lets dangerous monsters run loose, she breaks the law when it could get others punished, she enslaves dead souls, literally hundreds if not thousands of them, and she breaks her promises, she lies, and everyone likes her. Or at least they trust her and go, no, she, I don't like her very much, but she's very honorable, even though she's just not. Because here's the thing, in order to have a villain protagonist, you need to acknowledge that they're the villain but everyone forgives Vita all the time, no matter what she does, and fundamentally, that's the real problem here. Like, that, that makes it seem like the book is trying to make her the hero, and I felt like I was the crazy one for disliking her. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! And I think the author was trying to make her a villain protagonist, they just had no idea what to do with it. Now, Vita says she only kills people in self-defense, but that is blatantly a lie. Like, again, she murders a pregnant woman who's trying to run away from her, directly in front of Jalisa, and then later Jalisa forgives her and is fine working along with Vita after that. Uh, they, she also forgives her for possessing slash killing Melek when she dies the first time. Everyone forgives her for lying and saying that Lark was dead, because as far as she knew, Lark could have continued killing people after that, but she gets good vibes from Lark, so she allows her to live. And then when she becomes an Athanatos, everyone is fine with her killing and taking over the body of their friend, and when she escapes the prison, there's an Athanatos soldier there, and he says straight up that he's planning to weaken the island's defenses so Hive Rock can come over and kill everyone, and Vita is fine letting him live with her and her friends, and later he kills some Templars as they're running away, and she cuts off his arms as punishment, but he still sticks around and she lets him, like no one is upset with either of them for this. When she possessed Melek's body, she was laying low, pretending to be him, and she runs across a very drunk High Templar named Cassia, and had the chance to kill Cassia, but she didn't. And remember, she's laying low at this point. This is exactly what Penta did earlier. She's laying low at this point, trying not to draw attention to herself, but later, people use this as evidence that Vita isn't evil. You know, they're just saying, oh, she doesn't murder literally everyone in her path, but that's not, that's not convincing. Most people don't murder everyone in our path. That doesn't make us saints. Like, that, that's not even the bare minimum. It's like the foundation that the bare minimum lays on top of. 
Remember when she committed genocide of the squid people and then planned to conquer her, her home on top on behalf of the Athanatos? Everyone forgives her for that. <laughs> like, I I don't know why this keeps coming up in crappy books, but genocide of sentient species is never justified. Holy shit, I can't well, I don't know why that keeps happening. Again, the protagonist being evil is fine, but everyone forgiving them makes it seem like the book doesn't think they're evil. So this doesn't seem like a story about Vita becoming a monster. It feels like a story about a monster going around and then the author expects us to clap for her. She has a weird therapy session with Jalisa in the last book and admits that she's been awful for a long time. And then after that, she just continues being awful. Like it hints at character development, but it never really follows through. Unless you count her running off to save the world at the end as developing to be a good person. But if she does turn into a hero at the very end, then the story still isn't about Vita turning into a monster because she turns good at the end. And part of the issue is that there's so much shit going on here. There's so much shit going on. If the story just focused on a few of these events and cast the others aside, it might have time to show disparate reactions to what Vita does. You know, some people could forgive her, but others would be disgusted and hate her forever. You know, imagine if after one of her many crimes, some of her loved ones ran off because they never wanted to see her again and she was upset by that. Or imagine if she was like fighting people and they jumped off the island to kill themselves and make sure she couldn't grab their souls because they didn't want to be enslaved forever. You know, make it clear that at least some people see Vita as a monster, because without that, all we have to go off of is her friends shrugging off and forgiving almost everything she ever does. Like, if, if you wanted Vita to be a monster, you would have had to show that. Now, if you wanted her to be a sympathetic protagonist, then you would have had to have her reflect and start changing, ideally around the time she killed the baker's son. Because here's the thing, a group of men tried to extort her family and steal from them, and then her sister attacked one of them, and then he hit her and she fell and broke her neck, so that's how he killed her. It's not a whole lot different than what Vita did to the baker. Like, it's worse than what Vita did to the baker, but it's still, okay, you were stealing from someone and then they caught you and then you killed them. You know, it, it's pretty similar. There's parallels there. If Vita stopped after that and realized that, oh yeah, okay, they were acting not a lot different than I acted and started changing, then she could have been really sympathetic, but she doesn't. Like, that's the point where she really crosses the event horizon. And that's also fine, but you, again, you just have to admit that she's a villain and the books barely brush up against that idea. Like, I realized at the end, Vita has some similarities with Walter White from Breaking Bad. You know, she starts off very sympathetic, but she's still doing some unpleasant, nasty stuff. And then over the course of the story, uh, she just becomes a monster but it's done a lot worse than Walter White's character arc. Because imagine if in Breaking Bad, Walter was surrounded by people constantly telling him that they love him and he never did anything wrong, you know? Like, because in the show, by the end of it, his wife has left him and most of his friends and allies are either dead or they've cut ties with him completely because they want nothing to do with him. And it's all his fault, you know? We don't need him to turn to the camera and say, the writers have made it clear I'm a bad person. Because, and they don't need to do that because people around Walter react in a way that makes sense. You know, when he does and says nasty stuff, they react in a way that makes sense. And they don't do that with Vita. Like in the last episode of Breaking Bad, Walter tries to call his son on the phone one last time, but his son tells him he's a monster and hangs up on him. No, Please. what you did to mom, you asshole. You killed Uncle Hank. Listen. Why are you still alive? Why don't you just, just die already? Just, just die. Like imagine if instead of that, he said, hey dad, I remember the last time I saw you, I had to prevent you from murdering mom with a kitchen knife, but we're still cool. Don't worry about it. Because that's basically how everyone treats Vita. So while I do believe the author wanted to show Vita turn into a monster, she did a really, really shitty job of it. And then at the end, uh, again, for the last couple percent of the last book, she's not evil at all. Like, she goes off to try and eventually save the whole universe. Like, maybe if she turned the planet that she found with intelligent life on it into a farm like the Mistwatcher did and became just like him, the, oh, she's becoming a monster narrative would work. Or maybe if she just killed the Mistwatcher and took his place. Like, that again, that could work. It's like, okay, yeah, we're... 
she's not becoming a hero. She's becoming an evil entity. Like, that That could work, but this ending feels more like a heroic sacrifice than anything. And also, that wasn't Vita's original plan to save the world. Like, in the last book, she comes up with a plan for a perfect society based on the Athanatos, where you can't make everyone immortal because the Mistwatcher will notice and then smite them. So instead, she'll make a small elite population immortal, and then everyone else will contribute, and they'll all get, you know, food and such, and then they will serve sometime as a revenant slave doing more work after death. And that's, like, that's Vita's ideal society. So her, her plan for fixing the world doesn't even create immortality for everyone. It still allows people to be eaten by the Mistwatcher, but now Vita is in charge. So basically, Vita is a communist who wants everyone to be equal and provided for, which sound go sounds good, but she only wants everyone to be equal and provided for if her and her inner circle can live a life of luxury on the back of their labor, so I guess she's more of a Stalinist than anything. I don't know, that plan doesn't happen, so it's kind of a moot point anyways. Basically, I, I also need to bring up the religion thing, because that's weird. Vita is like a straw man atheist from a Christian movie, except she's supposed to be correct, because she's going on about how the church is evil and there's no afterlife, and she's correct, but then she uses that reasoning to enslave dead souls. And she's fine with that because, oh, well, they're just going to be eaten anyways. You know, why would they want the sweet embrace of oblivion? I should be allowed to mind rape them until I get bored. And the church also isn't that bad. Like, they helped Sky do the terrorist attack and then took over the government in the aftermath, but other than that, they seem totally reasonable. <laughs> because they outlaw animancy. Animancy allows people to control each other and kill with a touch. It makes sense for that to be banned, or more accurately, very, very heavily restricted, because there are a couple of people in the church who are allowed to do it. But they have others looking over their shoulder to make sure they're not doing anything unpleasant with it. And they have a place for natural-born animancers like Vita. She could help the church hunt people using it for evil. But she doesn't want to help them. She rejects the church because she doesn't want to follow the rules, like the angry atheist in every bad Christian movie. But also she's correct. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what the book is trying to do here. After a while, I realized that Vita and or Penelope would have been great villains. Whether they were, you know, villain protagonists or just straight up antagonists, they would have been great villains because they are sympathetic up to a point, but they're still awful selfish people and they're ludicrously overpowered. Like, they could have been a lot of fun to watch, but everything goes too well for them all the time, and no one who matters to the story calls them out on their bullshit. So don't come here and tell me in the comments, Vita is supposed to be evil, because the series did an awful fucking job with that. Once again, things that could have been brought to my attention YESTERDAY! Lark is in a really weird spot for me, because she's the best character in the series by a huge margin. You know, watching her grow from a literal monster into a childlike entity learning right and wrong, and then to a sort of grown-up who learns to make friends and fight for something greater than herself. Like, watching that is great. I had to ignore most of that in the summary because there's so much other crap to sift through, but it is genuinely great, and I liked it. At the same time, her role in the story doesn't make much sense, like, because she's a literal inhuman monster who became human-like by killing and torturing people. Please note the use of the term human-like, not she didn't become human. Now, when she killed and tortured people, she was just operating on instinct. She didn't really know better. Like, you can't hate her for just following instinct. That's, that's what animals do. But when she becomes more human, she has the intelligence and the life experience to know that what she did was wrong. It takes a long time, but she figures it out and that's what happens. Part of what makes her so dangerous at first is that she is an intelligent Rothiso. You know, she's much smarter than the others. When the hunters go to rescue captives, Lark has a bunch of live prey strung up in webs all over the place, so when she gets wounded, she can grab them and eat them and heals herself really, really quickly. So, eventually, she does stop killing people. At least, she stops killing them without good reason. Obviously, you know, self-defense and stuff is still allowed in her mind. Monsters need to be eliminated to prevent them from hurting people. People who have done what Lark did also need to be prevented from hurting people. So, whether you look at Lark as a monster or a human, she can't just be let free. That's ridiculous to think. And you may be thinking, oh, well, Lark has changed. You know, she's no longer a slave to instinct. She won't hurt anyone anymore. But that's not true. Because in book three, during the last long stretch where the story putters around and everyone forgives Vita for murdering Melek, you know, that part, uh, during that part, their team comes across a wild Rothiso, and it's a male that tries to mate with Lark. And 
upon seeing that, Lark just loses control and fights him to the death. Like, she doesn't kill him because he's a threat, she kills him because her instincts tell her he's weak and he's unworthy of mating with her. Also, at this point, we learn all the Rothiso are starting to breed and might overwhelm Verdantop soon, but the books just sort of forget about that storyline. <laughs> the reason I bring up that small moment is because Lark very clearly does not have full control over herself. She is still a slave to her instincts. Like, there's an earlier scene, not long before this, where one of the people she tortured attacks her and Lark has to resist the urge to eat her. And she does resist the urge, sort of, because she actually is about to eat her, but Jaleesa appears and shoves her hand in Lark's mouth, so she eats that instead. And Jaleesa does get her hand regrown. Like, the healing magic in this series is extraordinarily good. And so Lark doesn't actually resist her instincts in that instance. She just hurts somebody else instead of the person that she originally wanted to hurt. And keep in mind, at this point, Lark is powerful enough to stop the attack without hurting her, but instead she nearly kills someone. So ultimately, she is still a Rothiso and subject to the demands of being a Rothiso. She's not in control of herself the way a person can be, and treating her as just another member of the team is dumb. Now, it makes sense why the church would put up with some of this, because they're grooming her to be an anti-lich weapon, but the way that they just put her in the middle of the other Templar recruits, and who she might hurt or kill, and then the way that the entire city of Skyhope decides it's fine with her walking around and just living her life, that's dumb. Like, people wouldn't just let a monster who killed people and could go nuts at any moment walk around and exist among them. If Lark was really going to be a Templar, she couldn't be a normal Templar. Like, she, she just couldn't. She would have to live in isolation, whether she deserved to be treated that way or not. Like, it's not fair to her, but that's the only real solution here. And she doesn't really need training, because even without it, she's almost at high Templar level. Like, she could easily practice working with people like Galdra. You know, she could be trained one-on-one. -on -one. Because ultimately, no matter how human Lark acts, she isn't one, and the books either miss that or ignore that. And, it, I don't know, it's just really weird, and it completely took me out of the story. Because her character arc is about her becoming more human, while Vita's is sort of about her becoming more of a monster, which would work if Vita's... A character arc was better, but it's we already went over the issues with that. And I, I don't know, maybe Lark's character arc should have been more about her realizing that the church only wants to use her as a weapon and how she deals with that information. But whatever the case, she just kind of vanishes at the end. <laughs> like at the end of the last book, when Vita flies off, Lark, as well as pretty much everyone else, just kind of vanishes from the story. So while Lark is definitely the most complex and sympathetic character in the series, she feels incomplete, like her arc is just completely dropped before it's finished. Like, there's one moment in the final book that feels like it should be the climax of her character arc. Like, uh, Claretta, the other person that she tortured, does forgive her. Like, she runs into her briefly, and Claretta tells her that she forgives her, but she also never wants to see her again. So, really, she only forgave her for her own sake, not because Lark deserved it. Because, honestly, I don't think she did do anything to deserve it. Like, she became a better person, but that doesn't change what she did, and it doesn't do anything to help Claretta heal either. And I actually really liked that moment. But <clears throat> then after this is when Lark learns that Nara created her as a, rem a remote mouth, and then she struggles with that for a bit. And then the book realizes that we need to wrap things up as soon as possible, and we just, we just never get time to explore that. And really, that is the tragedy of Lark. You know, no matter how much I liked her, she will always remain incomplete, because the story just drops her. Oh my god, there is Edward, we love you, you're the best! No, Jacob's the best! <laughs> Galdra the Annihilator is the closest thing to an antagonist for most of this series. You know, she is the most powerful Templar in the world. She can fly, she can throw out ungodly amounts of fire, she can take down all sorts of monsters without even batting an eye. Like, in the third book, she kills Vita's invisible undead dragon without much trouble. It just happens off screen in a couple of minutes. Like, I don't think I've ever seen in anyone in any piece of media kill a dragon using fire. Just think about how powerful she would have to be to do that for a second. And on top of that, she's just a lot of fun to watch. You know, she's a jerk to everyone all the time, and Lark actually really likes her for that exact reason. You know, she, Galdra's a jerk to everyone, but she's also a jerk to Lark. You know, she's treating her exactly the way everyone else, or exactly the way she treats everyone else. 
and she works really well as a rival or ultimate obstacle for Vita. And then Penelope kills her in an instant. Like it's not even a climax or a big moment, she just smashes her head in the middle of a battle, and she justifies it by pointing out that she was an animancer, which is technically true, but she didn't have any actual proof. In the last book, she parades her revenant around in Skyhope for a little bit, and she tells the revenant, like in front of a crowd of people, she's like, hey, you can't lie, can you? And then the revenant goes, no, I'm a mind-controlled undead slave, I can't lie. I was an animancer before you killed me. And then people accept that as evidence. Like, why would they accept that as evidence? <laughs> yeah, this mind-controlled, undead facsimile of my old friend claims that my friend was a criminal when she was alive. That seems believable. Shut up, bitch! <laughs> because all foes fall away, all ideals and beliefs melt in the presence of Vita. And Galdra just being taken out really quickly without a chance to actually, you know, struggle or work for it, uh, that happens multiple times. It happens with most of the villains. When Vita was in prison and surrounded by a bunch of really powerful Templars, including the Warden who was a High Templar and another High Templar who doesn't get a name, like, they're all just snuffed out like candles during the escape. Although, to be fair, one of the High Templar guards is killed by Ars, but it's still too easy. You know, it, it removes the obstacle that the protagonist is supposed to overcome. And speaking of Ars, later on, he's like the ultimate Animancer who created Vita. And as soon as she decides to take care of him, she kills him with very little trouble. The army of Templars that go into the forest and attack them, including, you know, Lark's squad and the High Templar, their name is Arden. I, I've mentioned them once or twice, I may as well tell you their name is Arden. Uh, they're taken care of with very little issue. Vita only dies due to her arrogance, which could be a good moment, but it's barely focused on. Sky, the crime boss with telekinesis that could take out an army? Vita beats him once and he barely manages to escape, and then in the last book, Penelope kills him without much trouble. Lark, the intelligent Rothiso, who gets stronger with everyone she kills, she becomes a hero and Vita is able to fight her and her Templar squad all at once. And there's other way more powerful entities on other islands out there, but they almost never come up, so it doesn't matter. Like, this is really the problem with Vita being way too freaking strong for this story, because all of these villains could have been great to build a book or an entire series around, but none of them get the proper focus to work. They all get in each other's way, and then the books don't have time to properly show Vita overcoming them, so they have to die right away and then move on to the next one. Fundamentally, villains are an obstacle the heroes have to overcome. You know, there's a lot of different types of stories. Man versus man, man versus nature, man versus society. They're all about conflict, and the verses that man is going up against, that has to be an obstacle. If a villain fails to be an actual obstacle for the heroes, then they fail as villains. It doesn't matter how complex or sympathetic or deep they are. Like, it's satisfying to watch somebody climb a mountain, it's a lot less satisfying to watch them climb a molehill. Some of the villains here are sympathetic, and some of them aren't, you know? For instance, Ars is just a power-mad evil mage who enslaves people's minds. There's not much good about him, and he seems to acknowledge that. But then on the other hand, there's people like the Nara, who are sympathetic. They were dealt a shitty hand, but again, they can only exist by enslaving people, so you, you gotta take them out. The Athanatos are kinda sympathetic, because they're not evil, they just need food and water to live. But, sympathetic or not, they do all have personalities, I remember pretty much all of them, and I like spending time with all of them. I, I certainly like spending time with them more than I like spending time with Vita. Even the Mist Watcher, who is supposed to be an unfathomable eldritch god, eldritch god, has a bit of personality, so I just don't have much to complain about in that regard. But because there are so many characters, and the plot goes all over the frickin' place, none of the villains get a chance to shine. Most of them get one or two moments what, which intrigued me, and then they putter around until they're eliminated as a threat. And if that's not what the story's really about, okay, I suppose that's fair. But if the story really is about Vita turning into a monster, which we've gone over, it does a bad job of, we should at least be able to have fun watching her take down the heroes. There should be some struggle there. We should hope that they might finally stop, take her down and stop her evil plans, only to have our hopes crushed when she ultimately succeeds. There are multiple emotions that you can elicit or try to elicit from readers when the antagonists are beaten. You know, joy, triumph, amusement, despair, shock, etc. 
But whenever Vita defeated one of her opponents, at least in the second half of the series, because first half when she's weaker, it's a lot more satisfying, but the second half, she just overcomes everything too easy. Uh, whether she defeats them in a fight or just by bringing them into the fold, I just rolled my eyes. You know, I felt annoyance or disappointment that it went by so quickly and easily. And it's especially a shame because the first one and a half books handled this well. She was weak enough to seem vulnerable, so when she defeated people, it was a triumphant moment. And the back half of the series doesn't have that. I have been buried alive, but I'm alive. All right, so I guess it's time to cover the LGBT stuff. Like, gay or trans characters should be allowed to be awful, okay? I just want to start off by clarifying that. They shouldn't be held to an impossibly high standard. Expecting every single character of any minority demographic, really, to be perfect in every way and getting upset when they're not perfect in every way is stupid. You need to leave! I don't really have issues with Vita and Penelope being in a gay relationship despite them being evil. Like, uh, granted, I don't know if I'd call them lesbians, like at the beginning I did, but that's just to simplify things because their se sexualities are kind of complicated. Uh, but they do spend the majority of the series in a lesbian relationship, so people are going to see them as gay. You know, if I had to put a label on it, I would say Vita seems like a sex-repulsed asexual more than anything. Uh, she wants a relationship with Penelope, but she never wants to do anything physical. You know, but whatever specific label you want to put on it, they're clearly in the LGBT category. Like, that's an umbrella term for a reason. Vita doesn't see her bodies as hers, really. Her soul is the real her, as far as she's concerned. So she's fine when she takes over other bodies. There's not very much dysphoria there. Like, when she takes over Melek, she is weirded out for a little while about having a penis, but she's not uncomfortable. And I don't know exactly what to do with that bit of information, but it needed to be said. Plus, besides those two, there's other gay or bi people in the story, and most of them aren't evil. You know, Bentley, one of... Vita's hunter teammates is gay, at least I, I think he is, uh, because he's in a relationship with somebody that he thinks is a man, but then they start transitioning to a woman and he continues dating them after that, you know? Like, he, he's a nice guy, but he also does nothing in the story. And people's souls can be male or female, like Vita can see somebody's soul as male or female, so it's not weird to her that people would want to transition and change their gender. The first trans character we meet is Sky. You know, and I mentioned him earlier. He looks like a woman, insists on being referred to as a man. Then he gets his body magically turned into a male one. And no one ever gives him grief for it. And it's not the focus of his entire freaking character. It's just part of who he is, you know? And then another trans person shows up later. Uh, her name is, at first it's Xavier, but then she starts transitioning and she becomes Xena. And that's Bentley's partner, who I mentioned earlier. One of the High Templars, who I mentioned earlier, Arden, Vita kills them, and they are non-binary. Like, everyone refers to them using they-them pronouns. And in every case, people don't make a big deal of it. Like, they're different, but everyone is fine, because they live in a world of magic and monsters. Men becoming women, or people with a gender-neutral soul, that's not weird to them. So I think it's handled pretty well, because ultimately the LGBT community is made up of people, and some of them are going to be shitty, and some of them are going to be fine. That's just how that works. And also, sexuality and their gender identity, it's a small part of who they are. Like, it's, it's part of it, it's important, but it's only a small part. There's more to them than that. And everyone in Vigor Mortis fits that category. You know, there's not a single person who was like, oh yeah, that's the gay one, that's the trans one, or anything like that. They, they have more to them than that. However, there's one exception. Nugus. Jesus fucking Christ, Nugus. Or, sorry, the first three audiobooks are narrated by one person who call him Nugus. The last one pronounces it Nugas. I'm just going with the first one. Uh, I mentioned him earlier. He is a living fuck doll. And I'm calling him he because he's not really trans. It was forced on him, you know? He gets mind raped and regular raped at the same time. When Vita's sister gets killed in book two, the guy who was supposed to be on guard, who is one of Sky's employees, is partially to blame. Like, he stepped away and allowed the other people to go in and kill Vita's sister. So Sky grabs him and gives him to Vita and Penelope to do what they want with. So in between books two and three, Vita, or Penelope tears apart his soul and puts it back together to make him a woman that is in love with her, and then also alters his body to match and making him a twin of Vita. And he's happier this way and refuses to be changed back, even when they offer to do it. And 
Just what the fuck? <laughs> like, if they just killed him for getting Vita's sister killed, I would honestly not think much of it because I, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but I totally get it. But what the fuck? This dude is a sex slave and a regular slave at the same time, but he's brainwashed into liking his new station, which is really just one more thing to add onto the pile of nasty shit that Vita and Penelope do. But m mostly it annoys me because it reinforces a couple of harmful ideas. Like you can't forcibly trans somebody. That's not how that works. Like you can alter their body, in real life, you can alter their body via surgery and hormones, but you can't alter their soul in real life. Like, obviously, souls don't exist in the real world, but, you know, you can't alter their mind. You can't alter who they are as a person in real life. In the book, you can change both. And that kind of raises the question. If souls can be torn apart and changed to your heart's content, why would you have to alter somebody's body to match their soul? Like, couldn't they have just gone into Sky's soul and made that female so it would match his body and make him comfortable living as a woman? Like, theoretically, yes, they could. They could also th theoretically go around and fucking with all kinds of people's souls, you know, giving cis men female souls and vice versa. And this kind of un unintentionally supports the conspiracy that kids are being indoctrinated by teachers and social media. Like, no, that, that's not why people are becoming trans. It's just how they're born. Obviously, transphobes don't believe in magic, but they do believe in conversion therapy. And this book is just showing us a magical version of conversion therapy. Especially because Nugas seems to like his transition and everyone refers to him as a woman. And that really cheapens the identities of the other trans characters here. Like, transphobes don't understand, or don't want to understand, that it's just the way people are born and then transitioning is what makes them comfortable. By putting both of these, altering body and altering soul, on the same level, these books are very much missing the point. And I don't think the author was doing that to be transphobic on purpose, I just think that it was an oversight and they needed to think it through a lot more. Now, Nugus is the first man in the series who is forcibly trans. The other one is Melik, uh, who, I, I don't know if that one really counts because again, Vita, takes over his body and destroys his soul and then pretends to be him and then he dies so I'm not sure if it really counts but I had to bring it up somewhere. <laughs> this book series, Vigor Mortis, feels like a free internet story written by a teenager. Like something on Wattpad or Fiction Press. And if this was written by a teenager on Wattpad, I'd be much more forgiving of it. But I paid for these fucking things. And the real reason it feels like an internet story is, well, a couple of reasons. But a big one is that it just keeps bringing up new plot threads and characters without any idea on what to do with them. And rather than finishing one storyline before moving on to another, the books set them up one at a time and then bring them to a fast anticlimactic end with zero thought or consideration for pacing. That's why most of the villains are dispatched in unsatisfying ways. Like, the book's attention is split among so many different things that nothing can be properly explored. And when something is released one chapter at a time, like stories on the internet, it tends to have these sorts of problems. Like, a good example of this sort of thing is actually Fifty Shades of Grey, because that was originally on fanfiction.net and it was turned into real books. Some heavy editing could have fixed them, but they, you know, didn't do that. <laughs> uh, and so there are just constantly new plot threads coming into the picture and then they're dropped, forgotten about, or just rushed through because the author suddenly remembered, oh yeah, I have to deal with that. And Vigor Mortis, those books are long and could be cut by around half without losing much of anything. However, compounding the fact that they are really fucking long, that's a problem on its own, and compounding that problem is the complete lack of structure and the terrible, terrible pacing. Because when I say it feels like something that you could read on Wattpad or Fiction Press, I mean it feels like the author is making it up as they go. Again, one chapter at a time, making it up as they go. However, in this case, you can go back and edit. That's the magic of having books that are actually published all at once. You can go back and make sure it's complete before the public sees it. I have read long-ass fantasy books before that didn't feel very long because they were set up in a way where there's always forward momentum. You know, small subplots are introduced and finished that contribute to the greater plot. 
Uh, Harry Potter was really good at this. Every book took place over an entire year, but they flew by pretty quick. If we're talking about an entire series, like Vigor Mortis or Harry Potter or a bunch of other fantasy properties, every individual book needs to have its own plot that can be resolved while also advancing the overall plot. And that's complicated, but when done well, it seems really easy. If you've ever read a book series that feels like it slumps and slows down in the middle, it's probably because the author didn't know how to pull this off. And Vigor Mortis feels like one gigantic book that was just cut into four parts, and those parts are uneven. Like, Volume 1, again, it's not an amazing book, but it's the best in the series largely because it succeeds at being an actual completed book. You know, Vita learns about her powers, she joins the hunters, she trains for a while, runs into a big threat, and eventually helps defeat it, and then it ends with her vowing to change the world. Like, it's not great, but that is like a complete story which contributes to a larger arc. And then books two through four are about a hundred different things, some of which just don't tie together very much at all. E.g. Sky's terrorist plot doesn't tie in with Lark and the Rothiso very much. Ours taking over an entire country doesn't tie in with the Athanatos very much. Like, these things are all just happening separately, and only the fact that Vita is involved with all of them ties them together. Like, they feel like a bunch of separate short stories, almost, that take place at the same time. The reveal that Vita is possessing Melek's body and Penelope has been brainwashed by Galdra, that should have been the end of book three, because then we would have had a climax and then a last second twist that would make the audience want to see what happened next. Like, if it ended there, I would have been invested. I would have wanted to see book four immediately. But that's not where it ends. It has Vita go on an entire other adventure, and then a whole other climax after that, and it all feels very tacked on, especially because the battle against Hive Rock at the end of book three feels very half-assed compared to the big fight in the forest where Vita dies. And then this all comes to a head in book four where Vita barely seems to feel like she has any goals at all. Like, at first she's going, I want to hide my identity and be Ma Malrosa for a while. No, I want to conquer my home for the Athanatos. No, actually I want to make an immortal communist society, but only if I'm the one that gets to rule it. No, no, I want to defeat ours. And then the the whole Skybreak event happens and she's just reacting to that. Vita's character and the story as a whole just loses coherence. You know, at first she really just wanted to create immortality. And then the final battle, for lack of a better word, against the Mistwatcher should have taken up a lot more of the final book too. Because as it happens, it's, it's just over so quick that it feels like an afterthought. You know, the, the cosmic horror here kind of works, but then they fight against it, kind of and we're just left with very little, you know? Like, H.P. Lovecraft's stories usually ended <clears throat> with the cosmic eldritch entities still in power, and the heroes can do nothing about that, but it also ended with them going insane from the, revolution, from the revelation that the universe is so unfathomably large, and they are so unfathomably small. But this one doesn't even really have that, because Vita escapes. And even though the Mistwatcher is the ultimate antagonist, he's not given enough presence for us to feel much when Vita escapes him. Like, if that was her goal the whole time, was just to escape from this guy, then her escaping at the end would actually feel like something had been resolved, but that's not what happens. And she doesn't defeat him, she's just preparing to defeat him one day far in the future, which is very unsatisfying. Now, Vita's conflict with the Mistwatcher has only just begun, so there's no real sense of finality at the end of the series. So after that whole journey, like, I'm not gonna say the whole thing felt entirely pointless, but I feel like we ended before solving the big thing that we were trying to solve. You know, imagine if Harry Potter ended with Harry winning the Quidditch Cup, and then as after he wins, he basks in the glory and then goes, okay, now I'm gonna fight Voldemort, and then it ends. Like, in that case, the conflict has not been resolved. <laughs> Now, at least in Vigor Mortis's case, there were a bunch of other plot lines that were resolved before the end, but as I said earlier, they distract from each other, so they're not resolved in any sort of satisfying way. Now, there's a lot of places that the story could have gone that would have been cool and interesting. Like, what if it was about a natural-born necromancer fighting an evil church? Like, you know, an actually evil church. Or what if Vita is, you know, fighting the church, but the church is good and she's evil? Or what if she helps the church fight the Rothizo slash the Nara slash the Hive Rock invasion? Because remember, those are all those are all tied together. The Nara and the Rothizo are weapons sent down by Hive Rock. 
Or what if it was about Vita helping Sky overthrow the government and restructure society to be more equal? Or what if it was about Ars the evil necromancer escaping prison and Vita helps defeat him? Or what if Vita becomes an evil necromancer and conquers the world? Or what if Vita struggles to find her place in the world and wonders what she is and what sort of good she can do with her powers? Or if Vita learns about the eldritch god that rules their world and tries to find a way to free people from his grasp? Now notice how most of those are featured in the series, but none of them are really what it's about. If one of those had been the focus, I would have substantially less criticisms. Like hell, you could combine some of them and I, it would probably be fine. But you can't do all of them at once. Or rather, you can't flip back and forth between all of them, leaving them separate and fighting for attention. Because as it stands, this feels like parents who had too many kids, so they have to create a tier list for all their favorites. And if you wanted to do all of these, you would really have to have one book dedicated to one storyline, finish it in that book, and then move on to the next one in the next book. Because doing it all at once is just chaos. Bad things for a by-election candidate to say. I know nothing about politics, but I can crush a right pair between my buttocks. <laughs> I feel a little bad hating Vigor Mortis so much, because it's clear that the author had passion for it, and there's a lot of imagination here, there's a lot of clever ideas here, and some individual scenes are great, like the skybreak event at the end of book four is great, or the opening with Vita killing the baker and bringing him back from the dead, that scene is great. The themes and the ideas that get brought up are sometimes cool, even if they're not explored in a proper way. And Lark was a great character, some of the villains were fun. I love discovering more about this world up until the end, and I almost wanted to root for Vita to succeed, sometimes. But what we're left with when you get all those cool ideas is a lot of pieces that are good individually, but they're clumsily glued together into what can only be described as a fucking mess. Vigor Mortis has its defenders, and I can kind of see where they're coming from. Like, a lot of times if you're looking for fantasy nowadays, so much of it is just the TikTok fantasy book, which is like the exact same shit over and over again, and not even done well. So anything different from that, I can see how that would appeal to people, but do not try to turn me into a fan of this crap. Just do not. Like, I've heard that the uh, author has another series called Bioshifter, which is a lot better. And I'm not interested in it, but if some of the ideas and themes brought up in Vigor Mortis interest you, then maybe check it out. But, I don't know. At the end of it all, I don't regret reading Vigor Mortis. I, but I was, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was relieved when it was over because I just wanted to be done. I don't regret it, but I wanted to be done by the end. Because the books are just bad, and they honestly might be worse than you're thinking because there's so many disparate pieces that I've had to leave out talking about stuff that I disliked. This video is already too fucking long already. Like, the pieces I don't like, they don't tie in very well, so I've had to drop them. Like, I can't spend time explaining problems. But, that said, all the stuff I talked about earlier, like, that was the big problems that really dragged everything down. All the other stuff that's bad is bad, but it's superfluous. Like, do I need to talk about how Vita and Malrosa become two separate people who both live in the same body for a little while? and then the book kind of forgets that there's two of them during the climax? Do I need to introduce you to the dozens of named characters who all contribute to the story as much as Edward Habsburg contributes to Austrian culture? Do I need to go on about how we never find out exactly what ours did to wind up in prison, we just get vague secondhand stories? Do I need to point out that there are three countries on Verdon Top, and two of them are hardly a footnote, even though in one of them necromancy is commonly practiced? Do I need to explain that Vita uses the church helping Sky blow up a city as evidence that they are evil, but she's fine being allies with Sky, even though Sky is the one that blew up the city? Do I need to explain that it's dumb Vita spent literal years trying to find a way to bring back her sister and Penta, only for her to bring them back and then ignore them for the whole rest of the series? Do I need to tell you that Vita figures out how to undo the brainwashing of her revenants in the last fraction of the last book, removing the only real downside of her powers? Of course not. So let's just end this so we can all go back to doing something more productive. Goodbye. Hello, I'm sick, but I need to get this filmed. So uh, thank you for everyone for watching this far. Uh, thanks to all of my patrons whose names you see here on the screen. Special thanks to my $10 and up patrons, Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodes, Carolina Clay, Ich bin Langweilig, Kiana Arms, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, 
Michael and Katie Hake, Proscriptions of Zhuojang, Rovi, Psych XS, Slumbering Jellyfish, Observing Outer Space, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Vey Victus, and Wesley. All of you are great. I love and appreciate all of you. If you want to get your name on here, consider donating. You also get early access to videos as well as some exclusive content. And if you don't feel like doing it on Patreon, you can also do it on my YouTube channel membership page. You won't get your name on here because YouTube doesn't really notify me when people <laughs> do that, but you know, whatever. Thanks for thanks for watching. If you didn't if you don't feel like donating, just like the video, comment, subscribe. I appreciate that. My throat is sore. I need to stop talking now. Goodbye.